good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Honors Lecture Series for the fall of 2018. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the Honors College. I think we've had an incredible lecture series this semester, and I'm very grateful, especially to Dr. Mary Evans, for um, co-facilitating it with me and inviting so many uh, very good speakers. I think it's been a great semester. Uh, but the semester's not over yet. We have today and we have two more classes after today. So uh, the two classes coming up will be devoted to thesis presentations by your peers. Uh, Dean Vile and I have selected four students to give talks about their honors theses. Not simply the, uh, the research itself or the creative project, but the, pro the process of, of writing a thesis and, and things that uh, that the students have learned along the way. Uh, this is an important part of the lecture series. I think, it's, uh, I think it's beneficial to all of you because all of you are honor students and uh, you are uh, on track, I'm sure, to graduating from the University Honors College and a big part of that is the, uh, the thesis sequence. And so um, all of the students who were selected have uh, successfully defended their honors theses and they've done a great job. Um, of course, we would like to have been able to include more students in the, in the series, but it's not possible. But what we tried to do was invite students whose topics represented an interesting range of, um, of disciplines to give you uh, an idea of, of what other people are doing and, and what will be coming up for you. So, um, one, although the topic of the lecture series changes every year, one thing that remains constant is my desire to have our speaker for today uh, participate in the series. Uh, Laura Clippard is our director of the, the undergraduate fellowships office that's located on the second floor of this building. I think most of you, uh, I hope all of you, know Laura Clippard. If you don't, uh, she's someone you need to get to know. Laura Clippert has been here for 10 years in the Honors College, and, and she served very capably in, in her role. Um, we are very, very fortunate to have her. And I think, uh, I think all of you who have been involved in the process of applying for a scholarship or a fellowship know just how valuable her assistance is and how dedicated she is to helping you be successful with your applications. Even more than that, helping you to identify opportunities that align with your current interest, and even suggesting things that you may not have considered, but that she believes that you have the potential to do. We are very, very fortunate <coughs> to have Laura here with us. Um, and she is quickly becoming a recognized national um, a person on, na on the national stage. We just got back from the National Collegiate Honors Council meeting in Boston, and uh, Laura gave not one, not two, but three presentations at the national conference on, on different subjects, on the Fulbright, the benefits of study abroad for scholarships and, and career aspirations, breaking down barriers between honors and fellowships. Uh, she has been involved with um, both the Critical Language Scholarship and the Gilman as a national reader. And I myself, having been a national reader for the Phi Kappa Phi Fellowship, recognize how much work goes into that sort of thing. The people who serve on those committees receive uh, applications from some of the most talented students in the country. And it's a very difficult process to go through. But Serving in that capacity makes her even more valuable and more helpful to all of you because she understands what kinds of things uh, these, these committees are looking for and she can better advise you on how to present yourself to best advantage. She's also a member of the executive board of the National Association of Fellowship Advisors and she'll be in that capacity uh, through 2021. A lot of people are surprised to discover that we are so successful in getting national scholarships and awards here at MTSU, really. When you talk to people 
outside of the university, they are surprised to learn just how successful we've been. A lot of that uh, is because of Laura Clifford's efforts. Just to give you a few highlights, since she's been here over the past 10 years, we've had 16 Fulbright winners, 18 Gilman winners, we've had six gold waters and eight honorable mentions, and 13 REUs, a research experience for undergraduates. And the last one um, is something that we have been focusing on more recently. So if we had been working on that for 10 years, who knows how many we would have had. So uh, at one point, two or three years ago, the Chronicle of Higher Education recognized MTSU as a high producer of Fulbright Fellowships. So it's a remarkable achievement. So please join me in welcoming Lark Clippard and students who have accompanied her to help with the presentation. I'm delighted to be here today. I love working with my students. I love helping them go after those national opportunities. Um, I have pictures here of some of our winners. Bell or Pell went to South Korea. Um, Leah is going to Argentina. And we have a long list of people who have won these national awards. Um, I think one thing that is important to recognize is that these are things that are achievable for our students. And so I have brought winners with me um, who went through the process and, and uh, received a national award. And so I'm going to let them talk, and I'm going to sit back down. And then there are also a few people in the audience who have either received a state or national award that I'll talk about in just a minute. So I think we'll just go ahead and bring our first speaker up. OK. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint today, but my name's Caitlin Horner. I'm a senior here at MTSU, and I won the Gilman Award this past summer when I went to New Zealand. So the Gilman Award, the main thing that I think that they're looking for is diversity. They're trying to reach the people that don't have enough money to quite go. They, they really want Pell Grant winners, and, or not winners, Pell Grant recipients, I should say and other people, and they look for what's different. And so I looked at myself and I'm like, okay, I'm a Southern white girl. What makes me different going to MTSU? Well, I started looking and worked with Ms. Clippard and we found out I'm actually a first generation student. And the other thing that really makes me different is that I have two, I'm going for two degrees. One's in finance and one's in environmental sustainability and technology. And even though it sounds like a really long name, it's basically environmental science tree hugger, love the environment kind of research and going on with the engineering and geology department here. And that's what Gilman's starting to focus on. They want to reach out to those STEM programs. So they really talk about when they get those kind of recipients. They mention it as same with the first generation. And I just kind of wanted to say all that, not to brag about myself by any means, but kind of say every one of you is different in some way. The Gilman just wants to invest and diversify in themselves. They really are trying to broaden who they reach out to because it's not just, here's your money, go abroad, do great things. I've, after I got my award, they reached out multiple times with um, webinars and meetings I could go attend to broaden my networking skills and meet different people. And so they really don't just want you to get the award, go abroad, come back, the same exact person. They want to know that it changed you. They want to know that you want to do something different. And so that's... The Gilman, it doesn't just, it, sorry. It wants to teach you how to change and teach you how to um, do something different and not just the regular path. And so they're actually funded by the US State Department. And the weirdest thing about mine, I actually didn't get it on my first try. I applied in March, I was going in summer, and I got, okay, you're, um, you're an alternate wait on it until May. I was about to leave, get on the plane, and they said, no, sorry, you didn't get the, the scholarship. Enjoy your trip. And then I went on my trip. For seven weeks, I was in New Zealand. I went and did an internship there for four weeks, which was part of what also made it different. And that's something I really talked about was with the EST degree, you need to do an internship. You need to show that you can look at all this stuff interdisciplinary and learn about the environment in these different ways. 
And then literally the day I got back, I got a, an email saying, you just won the Gilman. And I went, are you sure? I just got back. And I actually surprised Ms. Clifford when I came back and told her. She went, are you sure? Really? Does that really happen? <laughs> and so we had to do a couple double checking, and it was true. So it's one of those, it could happen, it could not. Um, but studying abroad in general with the Gilman or with not, I think, is a great opportunity. It's something you should all look into because it does, it does the cliche, broaden your scope, view of the world, you see everything differently. But I went to New Zealand, which everybody would say is kind of westernized, and it still was a very different culture. They looked at things differently, I, especially going into that business and learning about how they viewed waste and then coming back here and how none of us can seem to dump out our Starbucks cups before we put it in the recycle bin. It's just little things that are different and that you can look around and see things differently, and that's what both my degree and the Gilman kind of taught me. And all of that being said, I do think everybody should apply for it. Ms. Clifford is amazing at helping you get your application ready. And the Gilman themselves, their website is really good. They have a bunch of FAQs to try to answer your questions before you even have it. You can reach out to their advisors for suggestions. They want to encourage you. They want to get people out there and get them in this program, or at least abroad in general. So I think it's a great opportunity, and I'm really honored that I actually got to go. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Josh Berninger, and I was chosen to go to a research experience for undergraduates, RU, at Tennessee Tech University this past summer. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the research experience I went to, but keep in mind as I'm talking about it, all REUs are different. There could be one in New York, there could be one in California. Uh, in fact, at Tennessee Tech, there was another research experience for computer science while I was there. So it could be about, about pretty much anything. Um, what I did, uh, it's going to sound really scientific, but I'll explain it. It's not at all. Uh, it's, it was called solar heat localization using a nanoporous medium. It sounds amazing, and I was really confused when I signed up for this. But uh, I got there, and it was essentially using uh, materials like carbon foam and other things to take the radiation heat from the sun and how if you put a a uh, glass of water out in the sun, the entire glass of water gets heated, uh, heated up. Probably said that wrong. By the sun. It takes that radiation heat and turns it to conduction heat so that just the top layer of the water heats up. Because only the top layer of the water can evaporate. And that's what they're trying to do is make the evaporation more efficient. And I studied that over all of the summer using carbon foam, insulation, and a bunch of different materials to try to figure out what was the most efficient combination. Um, for you, for how to apply to a research experience, uh, definitely talk to your honors advisor or your major advisor. I was literally, um, I was walking around the VET one morning. Uh, I do tutoring there, so I was walking in to give keys to my office. And uh, the major, the head of my department, Dr. Brown, walked in and was like, hey, I heard about this research experience. You should apply. And I was like, okay. This is really random, out of nowhere. And I was like, okay, I'll apply. Um, and I didn't know at the time how uh, big research experiences were. Because I uh, came in uh, to the honors building and talked to Ms. Clipper about it. I said, yeah, I got this uh, research experience for undergraduate. She's like, you got what? You didn't tell me about this earlier? Because I didn't know it was that big deal. But it's, it's a huge deal, especially if you're in the, uh, any sciences department. Because it looks absolutely amazing on your resume. And it gives you firsthand research experience without you having to have a whole lot of research experience on your own. Whereas uh, a lot of the, like, even the Eureka grants, if you have no research at all, you can apply for... Uh, for um, funding for your research, but the most they can give you with no experience is 500. But the REUs will usually be a paid internship. And again, they don't require much experience, they just require you to want to go and to be there. Uh, some of the things that I learned on the REU. Research isn't just uh, what you think, you know, a, a guy in a lab, lab coat with beakers testing chemicals and causing a small explosion. Uh, it's any sort of inquiry in any field that you're in. It's any sort of question you have that hasn't been answered. Uh, anything from, like, how do these chemicals mix together to how can we use the sun's heat more efficiently, like what I did over the summer. But uh, you won't always find the answer to your question the first try. I, I learned a big thing about research is determination. It's probably a little bit overused example, but it's still viable. Um, Thomas Edison. He tried to find a way to make a light bulb a thousand and one times, and he failed a thousand times. 
Like just take a second to think about it. You're working on an experiment and you fail a thousand times. That's years of trying and trying and trying and nothing working. And, but you can't ever stop because you never know when it might just be that last time that finally works. But I definitely recommend uh, applying for a research experience. It's a great experience. And I think all of you have the ability to make it into one. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alyssa Smith. Um, like my, one of my fellow speakers, I also won the Gilman. Um, and like she was talking about, it is highly about diversity. Um, but don't let that scare you. Um, a lot of people don't at first think that they qualify for anything diverse. Um, and that's not true. Uh, I sat down with Laura Clippard a couple of times and she helped me pick out so many things that I could use um, from being a first year college student to um, you know, some things throughout my history that I didn't think would count. Um, it does help. And um, another thing she was mentioning is that um, well, I don't know if she mentioned this, but the application process, um, along with trying to pick out things that you're diverse for, um, you have to write an essay about it, which shouldn't scare you. Um, it goes by a lot quicker than you think it does. Um, and then, of course, you have the follow-up service project, which is actually pretty fun. Uh, you get to choose what you do. Um, but um, I will say that the Gilman is, um, it's, you have to be a Pell Grant recipient, so it is for the, um, people who usually don't afford it, people who usually can't go on trips like this. And um, I was one of them. I didn't think it would ever happen. But um, I, the trip was pointed out to me by an advisor. And then the um, Gilman was pointed out to me by Ms. Uh, Laura Clifford over there. And um, I kind of just went for it. Um, I was thankful enough that I had her help. And the deans helped to uh, write the essay and critique it and everything. And um, thankfully, I got it. Um, this trip. I went to Brazil and I was able to do an archaeological dig in a couple of different sites in the Amazon. Um, it's kind of scary, but I got through it. And um, I will say that there are so many different trips you can do. And a bonus is that if you are interested in looking into doing a language, um, that you do have the added benefit of possibly getting more money. Um, and it's, it's just an overall, it's a great, um, scholarship that you could possibly win. Um, and I know she was mentioning earlier that they do send you a lot of emails and stuff, and that is true. Um, they send you emails before you go, while you're there. They give you opportunities while you're in the country you're in to, to participate in activities there to help broaden your horizons abroad as well as back home. Um, and I, I joined the alumni version of it, and um, they still send me emails and newsletters and things about doing leadership seminars and all kinds of things. And it's truly fabulous. I would very recommend, if you want to travel abroad, that you uh, look into this scholarship. Um, let's see what else. I will say that um, the application process, I wouldn't recommend just kind of jumping in and like going through it and just submitting whatever. Um, I would suggest taking time because they do look through these and they don't want to just hear about how, oh, I need money to go on a trip. You know, they wanna get to know you, they wanna get to know why you think you should go, and they wanna, they wanna get to know how, um, how the diversity that you bring is, you know, is gonna affect, you know, how you, how you, they wanna know how the diversity that you have is gonna make a difference, and they think, you know, and it, it's pretty important to them. Um, so take your time on it, but don't stress too much over it if you do decide to apply. Um, but overall, I think it's a pretty amazing experience. I wouldn't have been able to go if I hadn't gone for it. Um, and Miss Laura Clippard helped a lot in that process, um, talking me into it, helping me through it. Um, and she was very excited when I got it. Um, so yeah, I would suggest going for it. Um, and even if you don't, studying abroad is still amazing, still life-changing experience. I'm going to take a few minutes and talk about national scholarships, but I want to leave some time at the end in case you have a question for either me or our student. Yes, I guess the first thing is I was looking around the room and I realized and that there were some other people in the room that either won a state or national fellowship. So why don't you stand up? I know Peter and 
Did I miss anybody? Okay, so Peter, you also won. The, the Gilman for, um, was it 2016? I think so, yeah. Um, and it was for a uh, three month, uh, well, mm -hmm. 10 week uh, internship in Dubai in the Middle East with the Concrete Industry Management Program. So it was very work centered, but the Gilman really supports anything career motivated, mm -hmm. so. And then Robert, I think you won the Harold Love Scholarship, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So he was recognized, he's a very humble person, uh, he was recognized for his community service. So, yeah, you don't have to say anything else. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about fellowships. I I've learned over the years not to stress about telling you every aspect of every application. There are roughly 200 different national scholarships that you can apply for. And for me to try to list out every little tweak about each application is difficult. My role is to support you. Um, my goal is to make the process one that helps you. So if you win the, the scholarship or the fellowship, I'll do a cartwheel. If you don't win, that's okay. I want, maybe you can use those same essays and apply to graduate school. Maybe you can use those other essays to apply for another opportunity. Maybe you can develop some, some personal growth along the way. So I want it to be a good process. But what you need to do, and these are the bases, is you need to keep track of your activities. So it's going to be different depending on your major. But if you're in English and you're involved in collage, what was your leadership role? What did you do? Keep a record. Get involved. Keep your grades up, OK? And leadership is more than just a list of activities. It means how did you make a difference? You know, some students I meet, they have to work 30 or 40, 40 hours a week, and I feel real, really sorry for them. So they have to be more, uh, they have to really be careful with their time. But think about how everything ties together and how you made a difference, okay? So choose wisely and pursue passionately. Um, and learn about different opportunities. You know, uh, Joshua was talking about learning about the REU from his uh, advisor in concrete management. That's great, you know. So talk to people and seek out those opportunities. Um, you also want to have strong letters of recommendation. You don't need those for Gilman, but for a lot of fellowships that you do, and I always ask Dr. Phillips this question, and I, I know his answer already, okay. Dr. Phillips. What is the shortest amount of time that you were requested to do a letter? One day. One day. Don't do that, OK? Yeah. Yes. So if you are applying for a national scholarship for graduate school, give the people that you uh, are asking to write a letter, try to give them a month, OK? Give them a resume or a list of activities and tell them what you're applying for. I know that Dr. Phillips is very good about, if he, if he knows you're applying for a leadership activity, he can gear the letter that way. So your faculty and your advisors want to help you, but you need to give them the information. Um, the other thing that students get intimidated about, this is what it feels like to them, I know, is writing a personal statement. So I will have students say, I really don't like writing about myself, OK? And so I recently applied for something. I don't know if I'll get it or not. But I sat down and I looked at the paper and I said, I don't know what to write about myself. So you have to start this process early and you have to do some deep reflection. And this is why I said it can help you into getting into graduate school because that kind of deep reflection is going to help you later on in life. Um, the benefits of applying. Well, if you get it, the benefits are obvious. But it can also include, include Sorry, it can uh, improve your ability to write. Um, it can improve your goals and your clarity. Um, and it can help you learn how to handle multiple applications. So I'm going to start going through some of these opportunities. Um, I like to mention this one because it's available to everyone. Uh, one of our speakers mentioned it as well. You can apply for Eureka funding. And that is to the Undergraduate Research Center. You can get paid anywhere from $500 to $3,500 um, to do a research or creative project. So I think some people have received it. Raise your hand if you've gotten a Eureka grant. Okay. So there's some people that have received it. Um, if you have zero experience, that's okay. 
you can get a $500 Eureka grant over the summer, spring, or fall and do 60 hours of research or create a project with a faculty member. So this is a great opportunity and there's a lot of information. Uh, the Critical Language Scholarship is open right now, okay? So it actually closes, it's either November 25th or 27th, okay? But basically, it is an opportunity to improve your language skills in a critical area. Um, the one that is not listed here is they added Portuguese, okay? Some languages require previous experience. For example, if you want to apply uh, for the Japanese CLS and go during the summer, you have to have two years by the, by the spring. But they don't require anything for Turkish and some of the other languages. You do have to be able to tie it to your academic goals. So if you want to learn Hindi, maybe it's because you want to work in Bollywood and you want to make movies and you want to do all kinds of cool stuff. Or maybe you want to learn Japanese because you're going to be a business uh, person. Or maybe you're interested in peacekeeping and want to learn Arabic. It's not tied to any particular major. You just have to tie it into your goals. And there's a set of short essays. They pay for everything. This is a sister program to the Gilman and the Fulbright. So there's a lot of good options. Again, if you're interested, it's open right now. It does require two letters of recommendation. Um, the Gilman is a scholarship. I think I looked um, and I've worked with 18 different people that have won the Gilman. Um, and the Gilman is a great opportunity. It pays anywhere from $2,000 to $8,000 to study abroad. It does have some very specific requirements. You have to be going at least three weeks, okay? You also have to have a Pell Grant. But beyond that, they really want to know, how is this study abroad going to uh, impact you personally, academically, and professionally? So I love working with the Gilman. Um, if you are interested in studying abroad and you have the Pell Grant, this is a great, great option. Um, the Fulbright is also a good option. It is open to all majors, all fields. There are roughly about 140 countries involved with the Fulbright. And basically what you do is after you graduate from MTSU, you go overseas, you either do research um, or you act as an English teaching assistant. Uh, and now they have a, a new category, very, very small, where you can get a graduate degree. So for example, they have a master's um, in Korean language skills in South Korea. Okay? So there's a few graduate degrees available. You typically apply at the end of your junior year, although you can apply in graduate school. Um, and you can graduate from MTSU, and several years later, you can apply for a Fulbright. Sometimes you can take your family members with you. Some countries actually pay for dependents. So they're looking for open-minded uh, events. Those are little dates there. Those aren't, those aren't valid, by the way, OK? Um, but for the Fulbright, um, you can also um, act as a goodwill ambassador. So it is a program of mutual exchange. Um, students from other countries come here and we send students overseas. So it's a great option. Um, the Fulbright pays airfare, monthly stipend, health care, and dependent support. If you want to be, over, I always tell students, if you want to be overseas after graduation, you need to consider more than just the Fulbright though, okay? You can teach in Korea or Japan, the Peace Corps, and this is just the short list, okay? So I always tell students, if you want to get a job, you wouldn't put your application into Walmart and just wait for them to call you. You would put an application into Target. You would, start, you would want to get a job. If you want to be overseas after graduation, look into the full range of options beyond Fulbright. I have a list that I keep, and I can sit down with you and talk about options that are available for you. Um, a lot of the scholarships are fun. I think my job is fun. Um, one of them is called the Truman Scholarship, and I always tell students, I'm looking for someone who is argumentative, okay, and opinionated. But this person also has gone out and tried to make the world a better place through some specific concrete action, okay? So they pay up to $30,000 for graduate school, and you typically apply when you're a junior. Again, they're looking for someone who is involved or a change agent in our society, um, and they help pay for your graduate school. 
Um, for the Truman, it's a very interesting process. Um, if you get an interview for the Truman and you go to that interview, it, they, they will argue with you, which is, is different, right? So they want to know about what you believe, why you believe it, and they will challenge you a little bit. The Goldwater um, is uh, to, to help pay you now. Um, you have to be a sophomore or a junior to apply, but they're looking for someone who wants to do um, a PhD in the STEM field. So how many of you are in the STEM fields? Quite a few, okay. So the Goldwater can help pay for your fees. Um, there's also RAUs, and we've had a lot of students be very successful with RAUs. I, I love them. There's no trick here, okay? I don't know, I don't know what you got paid, but it's, you get paid between $5,000 and $7,000, plus typically they pay your housing and your food and your travel, okay? And you work with a small team to do research. Uh, there are over 600 REUs available. They're open now um, through January. So each site has its own set of deadlines, which can be tricky, but there's some wonderful options out there. Um, we also had a student who has gotten the MERT before. The MERT is doing um, healthcare research in countries like Uganda or countries without what we would consider non-Western countries. So they're looking for students who are interested in biomedical and clinical research. You do have to be a U.S. citizen, and they are looking for underrepresented groups. Um, if you want to go to graduate school in the STEM field, the National Science Foundation offers a graduate school fellowship as well. Um, this is a lot of money, three years uh, at $30,000 plus an allowance. The Udall Scholarship is for students who are interested in environmental issues and uh, or Native American healthcare. So like I said, these are very specific. Um, the roads, most people have heard of it. Uh, Bill Clinton had the roads and you typically go to the UK and you go to Oxford University. There's also other opportunities in the UK. Um, we had two students last year who um, got the UK Summer Fulbright Institutes and they spent this past summer um, in the UK uh, all expenses paid, um, studying, one did film and one did media and political action. Um, Phi Kappa Phi, Dr. Phillips has been heavily involved in Phi Kappa Phi. If you get an invitation to join, I recommend that you do. Um, I think these amounts are wrong, right? They've gone up a little bit? They have gone up. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the top award, and there are two of these, the top award is $35,000. So uh, Phi Kappa Phi, is one, of the, one of the main things that Phi Kappa Phi does is it supports student fellowships. And there are many good opportunities. Now, you would compete on the campus level to be selected because a university can only put one name forward. But if you are a member of Phi Kappa Phi, you apply for this fellowship and you're you're a finalist on campus, our chapter will give you an award. Uh, not just a certificate, but a monetary award. Uh, but then one person from, from a campus goes on to be considered for these. And I can't remember the exact uh, figure. It's like uh, 8,000. Does I that did, sound right to you? Well, I think the amounts have gone up. It was, yeah. when I did the PowerPoint before, obviously I think it was 5,000 and they had some 15,000, but I think the amounts have gone up. Right. We've gotten roughly about 16 of these, not in the last 10 years, but over the course. We have, we've been very successful at winning the $5,000 fellowship. Very successful on this campus. A lot of that attributed uh, Laura working with, with you, but also we have such a talented pool of students. And if you put the time and energy into it, you can be competitive for that fellowship. And I'm confident that sometime in the near future, we're going to win the top award, and that top award is now $35,000. Yeah. And that pays for a graduate school. That can be medical school. That can be law school, it, it, any kind of uh, education. Um, I try to, to encourage students that there's value in the process. So applying for a fellowship, you know, I guess the first thing is make sure it's a good match for you. I know that sounds obvious. Take some time, read over the website, 
read over the requirements. But if you feel like it's a good match for you, um, I would encourage you to apply. You can also come and talk with me. Sometimes um, I'll just have very open-ended conversations with students. You know, what are your career goals? What do you want to do? And then we'll talk about national scholarships uh, that might be available for you. I believe that life is a journey, not a destination. So there's very much value in the process. Um, but I think at this point, um, I wanted to allow some time for questions. So I think I'm just going to ask our, our three student speakers to come back up so that they don't have to, to run back and forth. So I think at this point, um, if you have a question about a scholarship or a fellowship uh, in the process, I see a couple of hands out already. I'll start with Andrew. I think my question is for you, Ms. Okay. Um, so <laughs> say you're applying to a program like the Rhodes one or two years after you've graduated. Do you think it's necessary to keep a good relationship with professors and such to get letters of recommendation? For the Rhodes, see, I haven't gotten into specifics with different fellowships. Rhodes requires eight letters of recommendation. Okay, so the answer to that question would be yes. Okay. <laughs> with Rhodes, you can't apply after age 24. Okay. Not my rule. Okay. So with these fellowships, they they all have these little specific quirks. Um, and that's why sometimes it's good to come and talk with me and sort through which ones are good for you. But for the roads, no more than age 24 and eight letters of recommendation. Yes, ma'am. Um, so for the, the Truman and other graduate school scholarships, or even I believe like the Fulbright if you're going to teach, um, I know, is it limited to like your junior year? Because like if I was a senior, but I'm still wanting to take a cap year for grad school, how does that, or they're just separate? Um, well, the, to answer your question, Fulbright doesn't care, okay? So with Fulbright, you can graduate from MTSU and two or three years later apply for a Fulbright, okay? okay? Or you can apply straight out of the bat. Um, Phi Kappa Phi, uh, if you're an active member, I think, will consider you. If you've taken a gap year or two, um, you would have to apply within the chapter. Is that correct, Dr. Right, Phillips? Right, And since you uh, directed this, back over here. I have the information okay, about the, okay. the fellowship. So beginning in 2019, Phi Kappa Phi will award 50 fellowships at 8,500 okay. each, and that is up from 5,000. So we have pretty consistently won the $5,000 fellowship, and so that would now be $8,500. Phi Kappa Phi awards six fellowships at $20,000, and that's up from $15,000. And then there are the two fellowships, the 1897 Fellowship and the Cheryl Carson Fellowship. Both of those are $35,000. So if you get to the point at which you are the candidate from the university, you have a good shot at winning one of these fellowships. You will be competitive. Uh, the other thing about Phi Kappa Phi, which I, I didn't put on my PowerPoint, I didn't want it to be too long, is they also have funding for study abroad. So uh, that's a, another good option. If you have a GPA, of, I think it's 3.75. At that point, you don't have to be officially a member of Phi Kappa Phi, but you can apply for the study abroad. You can, yes? What's the, uh, the time frame for the roads? I mean, how long does it send you off for more? Um, about two years. OK, so for the whole graduate. Yes, yeah, yeah. So um, the timeline, if you're interested in something like the roads, typically I do a pre-screening with you. Um, because it requires eight letters of recommendation, it's probably the toughest one. So I usually con encourage people to consider the full gamut. So again, you wouldn't apply to one job. If you're interested in Rhodes, what about Fulbright? You know, uh, There's something called Princeton in Latin America, or Princeton in Asia, uh, Princeton in Africa, where you can go overseas to those countries as well. So I, I encourage students to not just think within one window, but to consider everything. Do you have some questions for our students? Yes. Uh, my question's for the Gilman recipients. What was what did y'all's uh, follow-on service projects entail? Um, well, this is part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so essentially, you just have to pick some opportunities that allow you to spread the word about Gilman um, and about the foundation, um, kind of your experience about it, and how you went about um, going through it. Yeah. So this is also part of my follow-on project. I was going to come speak at the honors lecture series, but I also um, promised that I would have kind of a meet and greet with specifically my EST majors and kind of showing, because that's where my interest is with the environment, I wanted to show those majors specifically that you can also go 
to study abroad and you can use the scholarship to do that. And it just connects with your, like she said, academic and professional goals. Other questions? Yes, Andrew. So, this is for you first. The REU, um, what is the deadline for that for spring? Has it already passed? Um, well, do you want to you try to answer that question? Okay, okay. The answer is it's a rolling. Oh, oh for yeah. REUs, it's yes. rolling. Okay. So the, the deadline for you was when? Do you remember? It was like um, April or a little bit later. The, mine was a little bit different because they started the REU really late. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got in about two months before. So actually, it was about, yeah, it was about April when I had to have it. For so for the, fall? Or? No, that was for summer. For summer. For the REUs, those are the opportunities for STEM majors to get paid. Can I ask you how much you got yeah, paid? I got paid 5000 for the summer for two months, and they paid full housing, and they gave me a food stipend. So $5,000 to $7,000. Um, and the deadlines range from January to April. Very specific. Because each of those 600 sites gets to set their own deadline. Some are early, some are late. And so what I usually tell students to do is I show them the database and I show them how to search, is look for good REUs that are matches for you. Um, I encourage students to apply from four to six um, REUs. Um, some people have done 10. Some people have, did you just do one? He just did one, OK, <laughs> and he got it. So uh, you can do that too. But typically, I encourage people to apply to more than one. Yes. I had a question about the REUs as well. Um, how much prior expertise did you have to have going into yours that you feel like? Zero. Okay. Uh, for mine, it was uh, zero because it was on something. It was, it was an engineering REU, and I'm a concrete industry management major. Mm -hmm. I have no prior experience in engineering. And with that project itself, I'd never worked with something like that before. But um, I worked with both a professor and a PhD mm -hmm. student. And they were very helpful, very instructive, and, and very willing to help catch me up to speed. So the REUs are to give you experience. That being said, you still have to explain why you want it. Okay. So you know, if you're in concrete management, why would you want to work on solar panels or whatever the heating heating things up? You know, why would you want to do that? Um, I can think of a lot of good reasons, but you have to articulate that in your application. And typically for an REU, you have to have um, fill out an application or have a resume, sometimes both. And you usually have to have one to three letters of recommendation. Do you remember how many you had? I think I had three. OK. So uh, one to three letters of recommendation. The REUs, they're a really good opportunity. And usually what I encourage students to do is, you know, if you want to apply for that Harvard REU, great. But you will get a good experience no matter where you go. So there are some great state-run REUs like Tennessee Tech that have that professional development experience. So I encourage you to apply. And if you want to meet with me about the REUs, I'm happy to do so. Um, except you guys are going to get really busy during finals week. So <laughs> other questions? Yes. With the critical language scholarships, are uh, do those <coughs> Um, do you have to apply to them within a specific time range while, during your studies? Great question. Um, you can apply for the Critical Language Scholarship um, any time that you are an undergraduate or graduate student. Um, you have to be enrolled in the fall to apply for summer. So let's say that you were graduating this December. You could still apply for next summer because you're enrolled right now. So let me ask the panel a question. So what piece of advice would you give to somebody who is thinking of, of applying for a national opportunity in general? OK. Um, my best piece of advice is the cliche, you know, just be yourself. Don't try to talk yourself up. But also, ask friends and family what they think is the most different thing about you, or specifically what the, each individual scholarship is asking for get other people's opinion because it is hard to talk about yourself. It's hard to analyze. So maybe getting your parents' opinion, your friend's opinion, Ms. Clippard's opinion, you know, ask other people what they think and then try to think about that and expound upon it in it. And try not to make yourself seem overly fancy. I mean I didn't 
I'm sure he didn't talk about how he was great at engineering when he was really just a concrete guy. So it's, you know. It's, <laughs> well, it, it's, it's hard, OK? Because you, you don't want to put yourself down. You know, I've never worked with engineering before. You know, I really don't know that I'd be that good at this. That, you would not write that, OK? But on the other hand, you don't want to be too braggy. So it's, it's, it's a fine art, like you're talking about. Um, piece of advice, I would say don't let the fear of um, the possibility of not getting it keep you from applying um, because you never know. There are probably a bunch of people out there who are thinking, oh, I'm not going to get it, so I'm just not going to apply, which depletes the pool for you winning. So I would just say always apply. You never know. I'd say don't be intimidated by the, uh, the process. Uh, I'm, I'm applying for the Goldwater right now. Uh, don't know if I'll get it, but I first looked at it without talking to Ms. Clippard. And I, I looked at all the, as the, all the short answers you had to do and all the other requirements, and I was like, well, all right, I'm not going to do this at all, because <laughs> it was very intimidating. But uh, I would advise you talk to Ms. Clippard, talk to your advisors, specifically Ms. Clippard, um, and she will definitely help you out, and she has made this process so much easier. I'm 10 times more confident now about this process. He wants to put concrete on Mars. How cool is that? I mean, <laughs> you, did you have your hand up? Yeah, um, did I ever turn people down for being overly qualified? Because I know that happens like, in like, the job industry, but like, does it ever happen with like, someone having too much community involvement it, or too much? It can happen. It's rare, OK? So uh, an example of that, let's say that you've been a teacher for 10 years, and you want to be a teaching assistant for the Fulbright. So they would say, why do you want to be a teaching assistant? You've been a teacher for 10 years. Why would you want to be an assistant? But for most undergraduates, they are not underqualified. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I know that that does happen sometimes with REUs, though. Like, they'll take students who have no opportunity for research, like their school doesn't do, like, uh, scientific research in whatever field, and they'll take those over people who have done research, or who have done research in that field. and. Uh, I have a friend who won the Goldwater a couple of years back, and I can possibly give you her contact information. Yes. For some, it's Kirsten. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, the other thing is, like, uh, if you if you've already won an RU or you have tons of experience, I don't see that as a problem. Okay. Um, I didn't talk about uh, this one, but the DAD rise to Germany is open, and you get paid. And they pay your airfare now. They didn't before, but they pay. That you go to Germany and do research. So if you have too much experience, let's get you to Germany. Okay. So uh, it's not. It's you know I can work with that problem. Yes, ma'am. Um, what kind of research would be uh, available to like psychology majors? Because we do research as well, but we do more clinical mm -hmm. experience, like clinical research. I'm just curious. Um, there's a couple of options. Um, the one is is you can think about the Eureka grants, okay? So you can apply for a local Eureka grant. Within the REUs, there are a few areas that involve psychology, okay? Because there is some overlap, obviously, between mind and science. So within the psychology world, uh, there are some REUs for that. So you have to look a little bit harder to find those. But there are some REUs available for psychology. Yes. What's the website for the REUs? Do you know? It? Um, you know, I, I I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, you can Google um, NSF REU, and using Google, and you'll hit it. Um, you can also email me uh, directly, and I will send you a, sh a sheet. Um, uh, with uh, a list of opportunities. One of our transfer fellows. I don't think she's in here. Rachel. Okay. She won, oh, right, Rachel, no, not, 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 oh, maybe not you, Rachel e Eccles? Yeah, it was me. Oh, I'm so sorry. Tell them what you did. You didn't stand up when I said national scholarship. Um, I went to, I did a program called STEM Seas over the summer, and it basically was research on, like, the ocean floor, and I had no experience with that, like, whatever, but, like, whatsoever, but they had several different projects going on on board, and I got to help out with all of them. And like just on the ocean floor is really cool. So she was sponsored by the NSF. She went on a boat for two or three weeks. Okay. And did research. How cool is that? Okay. So, and you had zero experience, right? So, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you sitting there. I was, I was slow. But uh, there's a lot of good opportunities.
Any other questions? Yes. Sam. Well, there's a recommendation. Does it need to always be limited to professors, or can you also use like your boss get recommendation letters from your bosses? It depends. Look at what the website says. Okay. Um, for Goldwater, they want professors. Okay. Um, for the Fulbright, they like at least one professor, but it can be other people who are not professors. So you have to look to what the website requires. It, it usually will spell out for you what they want. Um, in general, you want letter writers who can attest not only to your aptitude to do something well, but your demonstrated ability to do something. And in, in most cases, that would be professors you've worked closely with. Uh, usually, you're not going to get the kind of letter you want from a workplace unless there happens to be some alignment mm -hmm. between the two. So, your choice of letter writers is really, really important. Um, you want to you want to ask someone who with whom you've worked successfully in the past. This is for everybody. Uh, somebody with whom you worked successfully in the past, somebody who's got the time to write you a good letter, somebody you believe is invested in your in your success, and somebody who can who can talk about your abilities and your aptitude in whatever your field is. Um, I think I'd like to thank our student guests for being here. So, um, again, my name is Laura Clippard. I'm upstairs, um, and I'd love to talk to you all about national scholarships. And if you have questions, um, if you have a question or two, I don't know how long our students can stay, but if you want to talk with them or, or me, you're very welcome to do so at this time. Thank you. And thank you, Laura Clippard.